From the Flight Hills Writing Project, this is The Suggestion Box, where teachers get ideas. I'm your host, Andrea Marshbank. Welcome back, everybody. It occurs to me as I'm recording this that I might have recorded a couple of intros without saying that this is where teachers get ideas. So uh, <laughs> we're all learning together on this podcast, so please forgive me and just know that we are where teachers get ideas. One of the many places where teachers get ideas. And the idea that we are getting today is from Mr. Nathan McAllister, who is a teacher at the school that I work at, a social studies and history teacher. He is very well known around the state of Kansas and the nation. Uh, critically acclaimed for various teaching awards and numerous items on his resume that are just honestly very, very impressive. And I encourage you to go check out his Twitter. He is phenomenal. And I'll make sure to link his Twitter below. I don't have it right off the top of my head. But he is a teacher that is very hands-on in learning, uh, makes history come to life for the students in a way that is, is different and doesn't feel so much like school, which is something that I think most of our students can benefit from, something that feels a little less like school and a little more like fun. And finding that area of fun is really tricky. It's really tricky. And I think that it could be said it might be especially tricky for those in the subject of history. Uh, but maybe I'm speaking out of turn there. We'll find out in this interview. But today, Nathan's going to talk to us about his project over Civil War veterans. And this is so interesting because I found out about it because he is in my school district, and my school, actually. And he was posting about what was going on in his classroom uh, via our learning management system, Schoology, which has kind of a Facebook feel to it as far as updates go, where you can tell the whole school what's happening with your classes. And he let us know that this was happening. And I was so intrigued that I contacted him, and that's why he's here today for an interview. But the basic gist right off the bat before we jump in is that students pick a Civil War veteran to research, and they research that veteran, and it's somebody who has a grave in the Topeka area where our school is. And so they, uh, McAllister has taken a picture of various photos of graves and that have indicated that the person who was buried there is a Civil War veteran. And so the students take that photo with the name on it and they do research that they then put into a database which is used like specifically for the purpose of uh, entering information for people who have passed. And it's just this, this great way where he's taken this very real world moment and made it a part of his classroom in a way that teaches research skills, as well as really invites students to, to delve deep into the activity of thinking about the stories of people who ha were involved in, in the Civil War specifically, but you know this could probably be functionally done with almost any war. So it's really exciting. It's, it's a subject that has definitely some Severity is the word. Like it's a serious subject, and he handles it so well, and makes makes these li like these lives are remembered better because of his classroom, and that's really, really inspiring. So, I hope you enjoy the interview today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Nate. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, of course. So um, we work at the same school. And so I was just, when I was perusing, we have this learning management system called Schoology for any of our listeners who are familiar with that. It's like Facebook, Edmodo kind of feel where we house a lot of our uh, technology-based stuff for one-to-one -one learning. And um, I saw on there that you had posted about this really great unit, which was one of the awesome parts of Schoology is that we can, you know, talk to each other, you know, without having to actually talk to each other about... Uh, like units that are going on in the classroom. And as I say that, I, I hear how much that sounds like I don't want to talk to teachers ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that. Um, so would you tell us, I, I'm a little, like, what's the title we should, like, how do you refer to this unit with your students? Or is it a project, a lesson? Like, what kind of nomenclature do you assign to this? 
for the students, it's the project is known as the Civil War Soldiers Stories. Mm -hmm. um, you could call it cemetery research. You could call it uh, Civil War Veterans uh, Database. There's a ton of different ways you could refer to the project. But for the for the students, we just call it the Civil War Soldiers Stories. And it's, it's interesting. At the beginning, it's very academic. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're still learning the vocabulary of that time period. They're learning how to use the research tools. And by the end, I just say, hey, who's your guy? Mm -hmm. Who's your soldier? Yeah. And they, oh, he's uh, so-and-so with the 74th Indian Infantry. And, and it becomes very second nature. Yeah. Whereas at the beginning, I say, who's your guy? And they say, I don't know. He's a Civil War veteran. He he, he fought for some state. And some, I don't know what the regiment, I don't know what those numbers mean. I don't know what these <laughs> initials mean. Yeah. So you, you kind of, you delve into that. So when you talk about at the beginning, it's very academic and they're learning all the research terms. What is What does that look like in the classroom? How do you teach them research terms? How do you teach them the, you know, those academic parts of this? Well, a lot of it is uh, just going through the basics. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the abbreviations are not standardized. Mm. And so you might get corporal um, as an abbreviation CPL, which we would imagine. Mm -hmm. Or it might be C-O-R-P-L. And <laughs> it's very interesting. And, I, and that's part of the, what we go through. That, and, and we'll use headstones to show the differences in vocabulary, the differences in abbreviations for names, and, and and then part of that is going through and showing them that in the research, because all, most of this is handwritten on pieces of paper, it depends very much on the person who has that pen in their hand. Yeah. So William may be WM and then the last name. It may be WML and then the last name. It mm -hmm. may be just a W and then the last name. Uh, and, and so it just it, – it, it, there's no standardization. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, so maybe I've, maybe I've jumped too far ahead in this a little bit. So at the very beginning, like your very first step in this whole, in the Civil uh, War Soldiers stories, do you, so it sounds like you're starting with the headstone. Like you, do you, do you pick a headstone and then that's like the inquiry for the research? Actually, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, the first thing we do, and I know this sounds kind of silly, but um, I have them pick their soldiers. So I just have a, and, and this is very strange, and not many people do this, but in the summer I go around and to the cemeteries and take pictures of headstones of, of Civil War veterans. And so I have this stack, and then they start picking. And then when they hear a name that sounds interesting to them, or as some students will pick, they'll pick the same first name as theirs. Aww. And uh, or last name, yeah. which that sometimes happens. That's really cool. It is. It is kind of like a things teachers do for their kids yeah. kind of moment. <laughs> or the, or it's a strange name like fuel is is a name we've had, yeah. or flood, or dribblebus. <laughs> you know, and some kids will say, "Oh, that's the name I want," it, just because it's strange. Yeah, they or develop unique. That relationship with the name, like right off the yes, bat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we go through and we just pick at, pick from the headstones, and okay. then I write their name and on the headstone so that their name and the soldier's name are kind of one now. They're married together, and that's their guy now. Yeah. Okay. So so you start with like this this um, they pick their their name, and then we move into this academia that we were talking about, where you you talk about like the the stand the abbreviations aren't standardized, and you've got like what other problems do you encounter that the kids have to kind of sort through or figure oh, out? Probably the worst. The most difficult aspect of this project is the fact that names are not spelled the same. Oh. First names, last names, um, initials are used, mm -hmm. and it's, you may spend five hours, uh, you know, some student at home, researching who they believe is their guy, and mm -hmm. they come back to school, and, and it's not. Yeah. Because... Um, this person's name was attached to somebody, and it, you know, because there are several common, common names. Right. Um, so we're just like there are today, but uh, they, the spellings are different, and uh, I've had as many as three different ways to spell a last name, mm -hmm. which that can be very aggravating. Oh yeah. And the fact that uh, 
while you were uh, doing your research on on ancestry, mm-hmm. you you may find somebody the same name who moves to Kansas mm-hmm. after the war, but is not your guy, but shares the same name, same first name, same last name, moves to Kansas, and and that that's where you got to you've got to get into the minutia of. Okay, but we have to understand they moved to. We know they live in Topeka at some point. Right. So if you're looking at a guy in Wichita, and he stays in Wichita the rest of his life, that's probably not your guy. Right, because he's he's in Topeka. Yeah, we know he is because yeah. he's buried here. Yeah. So wow. those are little little skills that they have to learn, and state abbreviations are not always the same, which is always aggravating. That creates, like, as, a, as an English teacher, there's a large part of me right now that's, like, going through the whole, like, you know, kids often ask, like, why do we have to spell things the same way? And I want to be like, when you take a Nathan McAllister's church class, you're going to understand. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And I know that that's, like, a lot of times when, um, like, the original, like, Shakespearean plays, like, spellings were wildly different and everything like that, too. So you mentioned Ancestry. Is that, like, Ancestry.com? Do you do research sure, on sure. there? Yeah. And, and that's the next step. So once we go through... All of the state abbreviations, all of the rankings, all of the different regiments. So you might have somebody with the United States Colored Troops, USCT. You might have somebody in the heavy artillery, which is HA, or LA, light artillery, or cavalry, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So after we go through that, then it's on to the different sites that we use. Uh, One of those is Ancestry. Mm -hmm. You can access Kansas records for free through the Kansas State Historical Society, which is a great benefit to us. As long as you have a driver's license, and which most of the kids do, they can access Ancestry on their computer at school or at home or wherever, and they can get Kansas census records. They can get Grand Army of the Republic Post reports, GAR Mm -hmm. reports, which those are exceedingly beneficial. They might even find enlistment records Mm -hmm. uh, if they were part of a Kansas regiment. Um, and then beyond that, we use Soldiers and Sailors Database through the National Park Service. We use um, individual state um, adjutant general reports. And some states have very, very, very good Civil War records mm-hmm. because after the 150th anniversary, it seems like every state that was involved in the Civil War wants to be that repository for right. Civil War records. And states like Ohio, Pennsylvania yeah. are exceedingly good. Um, and then beyond that, we sometimes call. Uh, we've called little local historical societies in Pennsylvania or Virginia or yeah. Illinois or wherever and to see if this person indeed did live there and what they can tell us. And, and those, two are skills that you, you don't just pick up when you're sitting in a class normally, and so they have to understand how do they ask the question that they're trying to get to Mm -hmm. while at the same time not sounding demanding or rude. Yeah. So it's, hello, my name, and this is what I'm doing, and is there any assistance you can provide? And we called, this year it was interesting, we called uh, a little historical society in California Mm -hmm. because there is a Civil War veteran from California buried in Kansas. It's a long ways away. Yes, it's a it's a very 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 strange story. Yeah. He enlists in California, ends up fighting in the Arizona territories, uh-huh. mainly Native Americans, um, and then at the end of the war, he's in New Mexico. So, for whatever reason, we'll never know. Probably never know. He decides to not go back to California, but instead come to Kansas. Yeah. Now, my guess is the Homestead Act had something to do with that. Right. And comes here and spends the rest of his life here and is buried at Rochester Cemetery in Topeka, Kansas. I have so many questions, but while we're on this strain right here, like, do do you have your students, like, hypothesize reasons or do do they naturally, like, want to guess why their their people, like, moved around so much or did or didn't? Yeah, there's, there's a very, there's a variety of reasons why students come up, you know, their reasoning why somebody would leave, say, Virginia. Mm Mm-hmm or a Pennsylvania, or a Maryland, which are very logical Mm -hmm. and wanting to get away from just the death and destruction of what had happened back east, um, wanting to make a new life for themselves. Those are all very probable 
reasons or theories mm-hmm. for somebody moving here. Um, obviously, the Homestead Act that was passed in 1862 in the middle of the war mm-hmm. has a great deal to do with people coming to Kansas specifically because so much of the land that had been um, through treaties taken from Native Americans is now up for grabs basically for uh, um, U.S. citizens. Yeah. And not much of that is going on during the war. Right. But certainly after the war, there's a ton of Civil War veterans who are wanting to find something different. Mm. Now, the gentleman from California, you're going to be thinking to yourself, why? Mm -hmm. One, how did he get out to California in the first place? Yeah. Two, why does he come back east? And that's where part of the Civil War has to play. Um, and then why come to Kansas? So the, the, the theories abound. Yeah. And sometimes it's family. Sometimes maybe it's as simple as, you know, there's a girl that they fell in love with and she, that's where she's from. That or was that, my initial thought. <laughs> I was like, he met a girl and she had to go back home. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's really intriguing. I, I guess I have it. Well, and when you say it like that, like all of a sudden as a person who has like a very strong interest in history, but in a very general way, like not in the, the sense that I've done any serious coursework or I've done any, like I'm now very intrigued by this one person involved in the Civil War. Like you have garnered a lot of engagement from an audience member who maybe didn't realize that that was happening. I can't imagine the kind of engagement you get from your students with that. Like this seems so much more personal than like, you know, the sit and get, which is sometimes needed. But do, do your students, be, like do you see their engagement with like these kinds of because it is it's storytelling well and yes i would say it's it's hit and miss if the students are able to feel success in research Mm -hmm. they're not in other words they're not hitting a brick wall after brick wall after brick wall then the story comes easier Mm -hmm. the telling of that story is easier and they feel more engaged and they feel more connected to that person if however they are hitting that brick wall. Yeah. They are less likely to be engaged in wanting to tell the story. They just want to get it over with at that point because it becomes so frustrating. And that's part of the research, which I try to put a positive spin on. I mean, that's, that's part of being a historian. Yeah. Is you're going to hit those brick walls and sometimes you have to dig a little deeper and in different ways. And sometimes you have to go through the back door and sometimes you have to find... Uh, their regiment instead of them and then go back through their regiment piece by piece by piece to find them, which Mm -hmm. does happen because records are often incomplete. I mean, it's the Civil War. It's not like there were computer databases back then. Right. Absolutely. I could definitely see a student becoming frustrated with that. And uh, but I think you're right. I think it does. It, it makes the real world and we're trying to teach them real real world skills. So do you let them? <laughs> I feel like this comes up in like way more podcast episodes than I'd ever anticipated. Do you how, how does your relationship with this particular uh you know, unit and Google, how does that work? Like, do they Google when they research? Do they like, do they open up google.com and type into the search engine? Or do you like, you know, do you, because I, I can't imagine that would be super effective for this, but I also, there's a part of my head that's like, well, maybe if they had like a really specific name or like, hmm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, Google does, it's, off, you know, it's second nature for a lot of these kids. Just right. Google it. And it is funny. They will Google some Civil War veteran's name and get a lawyer that lives in New York City and say, well, this guy's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is not. <laughs> he can't be alive in New York City and be buried in Rochester Cemetery. These can't happen. <laughs> that just doesn't work that way. I am pretty certain we could go talk to the biology teacher and discuss that. But uh, that is attempted. And sometimes for whatever reason, they may be a Medal of Honor winner, their name might come up Mm -hmm. on Google and just a general Google search. However, um, they are, they are using Google. If they're looking for adjutant general's reports from a certain state, that's something they can Google. If they're looking for enlistment records, sometimes they can Google that or just in general, what, you know, if they can find out where the regiment was at a particular battle mm-hmm. and they just need information about that battle, yeah, they can Google that. That's pretty That's pretty easy. But for the most part, we're very, very, very specific. And, and a lot of it's this, what you might term, into the weeds research. Mm-hmm. We're not, there's, there's very little Googling going on. Right. 
which is, I think, probably the the ideal because you're you know you're beyond demonstrating to them how to get past roadblocks or to maintain the you know the personal grit to deal with that. Now they're delving into like the the accessibility of these research databases and understanding that they even exist. Like I'm I you know I've lived in Kansas my entire life and I did not realize that the Kansas Historical Society allowed like special access to people with driver's licenses. Like that's really neat, and I just had no idea because that's not something that I had pursued. So that's really exciting. Um, do you let, if your students hit continual roadblocks, this is such a student question, do you let them pick a new person? Yes, we do. Okay. And <laughs> nine times out of ten, our roadblocks come in the form of African-American soldiers mm-hmm. because records prior to the war are almost non-existent. Yes, yeah. And that's difficult. Um, however, I, it's not one roadblock and we're done. Right. It's, you know, let me see what I can find. Let's go through an a- another avenue. Um, one of the other areas is newspapers.com, which the Historical Society also uh, it makes available to mm-hmm. all Kansas residents. And this year, very excitingly, you don't even need a driver's license. You just get on, and newspapers.com is open to you. That's nice. Which is great. Yeah. Um, and there what you can do is if you have an idea of when the person – died, Mm -hmm. which we can call the cemetery and usually find out, it's find the obituary, Mm -hmm. which will give us some information. And then beyond that, you can start confirming things. Because a lot of this is, are we getting the correct information on that headstone? And can we confirm it? And what else can we find? Can we find personal information? Were they married? Did they have kids? Mm -hmm. Um, Where did they live? Which is very interesting because... U.S. Uh, city directories are also in ancestry. You can find some of the students have found exact spot, uh, city address, where this person lived, and they can find, you know, this is where they live, this, yeah. and take a picture of it. That's really interesting. When you're teaching, like, all of these strategies for trying to find different information and, you know, you know, looking at ancestry to pick out different cities where they might have lived, how do you, is this kind of like a learning by doing? Like, as students kind of come to roadblocks, you're like, oh, well, we could try this, or do you have, like, a pre-teaching unit where you're like, all right, like, this is all the strategies we're going to use, and now you have them all? Like, how does that look in the classroom? It's a, it's a bit of both. Mm-hmm. Um, we go through ancestry. We talk about newspapers.com. We Mm -hmm. talk about the soldier and sailors database, which is very, very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, on top of that, we have all the abbreviations and name spellings and all that. But sometimes, you know, you have to go by feel. You'll get to a website and some kid will say, well, hey, this regiment has their own website and this person's done all this research. Fine. So be it. Mm -hmm. Um, I have... you know, kind of a, a baseline. Here's where you need to go first. Mm-hmm. But after that, it, it can go in many different directions. Yeah. And the, the kid that had the guy from California and ended up calling the historical society out there, that was, we'd been finding nothing. And that little historical society had a just oodles and gobs of information yeah. about this guy. She was the one that told us that he had moved to, or that he was in New Mexico when he was uh, mustered out of this out of service and we knew when he went out of service we just didn't know where or you know anything Um, and that's that's where some of those other skills come into play and I didn't necessarily tell them that they you know they might have to call a historical site I just said that you know there's there's other ways we can find stuff and it's every year it seems like something else is being added Mm -hmm. Because the Civil War, now we're at the 155th anniversary of of many battles, so Mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing more information. Again, there's going to be a peak. Mm -hmm. I imagine at the 160th, we're going to see the same thing. So every year, it seems like there's more added. And the National Archives released, what was it, African American service records Mm. this past year. So that that was a big, big deal for us. Um, but there's many of these records that are still accessible only by paying. And that's where I've been trying to work out getting us an account with, say, Fold 3, which is military records, mm-hmm. which would be great for us because we could just punch in somebody's name, get their enlistment information, find right. out all that we needed. And as it is now, we have to spend, go down different avenues just to find 
confirm yeah. enlistments sometimes. So are those kinds of accounts like uh, I know that some some research databases can be very expensive. Is that like part of the financial impediment to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Fold three doesn't really have a, uh, a you know an educational billing. I mean, they're they're usually dealing with major universities or right. individuals. Mm-hmm. They're just not used to working with high school, so they don't even know how to talk to us. Right. They're like they're either one person or like. 30,000. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And one high school is not not up their alley. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's <laughs> that's been a strange conversation. Um, sometimes I get lucky. Um, I, I do know a few Civil War historians who can help out, uh, but I don't like to pick on them too much because then it feels like they're doing all the work for us and then they get frustrated. And so yeah. it's only in those rare occasions that I need something Right. Uh, that we just can't find anything, and yeah. I really need their help, that I'll go to them. Yeah, it's always good to reflect on the community for resources. So when you're doing this in the classroom, what is it, what is it, like, what are the logistics of it? Is this, how long does this take you? And, you know, what does your classroom look like during this time? Is this, like, something that the students mostly complete outside of the class, or do you have, like, select days where you're like, okay, these are, this is what we're working on for, you know, so long? Um, you know, I always tell myself this is going to be easy. This is going to be quick. We're going to get this done. And every year we hit those roadblocks mm-hmm. or we hit something else, and it takes longer than I think. And usually I set aside probably two weeks of mm-hmm. class just to go through this and try to get all of the information because I have to set up the, you know, the stories that they write have to reflect the military side of the, the gentleman mm-hmm. and his personal life. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, to help those genealogists, where did they get the information Mm -hmm. so that they too can go through and find that information out. Um, And and, and the research always takes longer than I always believe it will. And that's partly because I've done it so much, it just seems second nature to me. Mm -hmm. After doing this for seven years, it's it's not not a big deal to go through GAR records and look through the cursive handwriting that's it's almost impossible to read for the normal human being but for a student who doesn't see cursive on a regular you know <laughs> daily basis it's uh it's like a foreign language yeah wow that brings up a whole different podcast <laughs> oh yeah so so they may spend and sometimes we'll have a gar report on the screen blown up so we can and Nobody can make out what this says. Yeah. So trying to figure out what it says. We even have magnifying glasses in class, and we'll print it out and try to blow it up that way. And um, so, you know, little things like that that you don't expect right. come up. Right. And and then sometimes, you know, you run into the mistakes, and names are spelled wrong, and or they go by some other name mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Right. You know, William becomes Bill. Right. So the time frame is a little bit, I, I'm flexible. I understand that it, it's not going to be done, mm-hmm. you know, overnight. Um, as far as the story, writing the story, that's usually fairly quick. That's outside of class. Get it done. Right. Because it's short. We can't, we, we put all of this on Find a Grave, their website. Mm-hmm. And we have a, an account. The high school has an account. And we can't have a three-page research paper on this person on find a group they're just not going to do it right so two paragraphs usually is all we get yeah and this is findagrave.com right okay okay great website this is uh where everything goes now and for a time the the kansas state historical society had started a database but it became too uh how should i say it became too difficult to regulate because they had somebody working full time just to make sure you, the kids were doing the research correctly. Mm-hmm. Well, when you had students from all over the state trying to put stuff in, mm-hmm. and then one person trying to go through and make sure that that was correct, and then finding mistakes um, with spelling or mistakes with research, finally they just shut it down and said, "We can't do this anymore. We don't have the funds. We don't have the manpower." Mm-hmm. And sometimes, because there was no, how should I say it? No regulations Mm -hmm. where the teacher would have to approve what was submitted. Kids could just get on submit, you know, without prior approval. Um, You were getting 
some lackluster right. information being put on on that website. So through findagrave.com, our high school has an account. And do you have to like moderate? Like do you you know you read through the ones that get posted? I'm the only one that can post. Oh, okay. On so, find so a grave. You are so the that filter. I'm the filter. Yeah. Okay. And so they have to submit to me, and usually it just we Google share. Right. And I can go back there and comment and mm-hmm. you know correct this. Um, this needs to be capitalized, and and it's very strange because it is a lot of governmental uh, legalese, and so you're just not used to working with that. And those things need to be corrected. And then once it's all done, I can just copy and paste, put it in find a grave, and be done. Yeah. Talk about an authentic audience like that's I mean, because that's useful for people. People use that. And, you know, other history classes and people just interested overall. Um, I'm really interested in like doing things that have authentic audiences, especially because we write a lot of like academic literature analysis essays in my class. And so when you <laughs> who is the authentic audience for that? Who wants to read these students essays but me? And so there's a whole other conversation there to be had. But that's really great that you're giving students this access to a way to show that research really does like help and benefit the community in ways that maybe they hadn't seen before do they do they do they like posting on find a grave is it neat for them to have that up there are they kind of ambivalent to it no it's it's very interesting they um they get a little upset if their their story because if we if somebody has already started a memorial Mm -hmm. on find a grave that's what they're called a memorial to an individual on find a grave we don't own it in other words we can't submit and it's just and it's up yeah we have to give it to that person that owns the memorial Uh uh-huh and then they have to decide whether to put it up. Oh. So <laughs> it's great when we can find someone on Find a Grave that doesn't have anything. In other words, we have a headstone that nobody else has done anything with. Yeah. And then we own it. Right. It's our memorial. We can put the information up, and it's done that day. Yeah. Otherwise, we have to wait. Yeah. And it's very frustrating for the students because they'll check and they'll say, hey, my guy's stuff's still not up. Oh, and no. So I'll message the person that owns that memorial and ask them. And uh, usually they're they're just busy. Yeah. They they have lives, and this isn't a priority for them. And I understand that. I get that. Uh, but when they put it up, it's really kind of nice because then it says, you know, thanks to the students of Aww. Seaman High School, and and they're like, yeah, that's my story, and yeah. there it is. And even the you know the ones that uh, don't don't want to show that they're engaged really are. I mean, they, they get kind of excited that their, their story's online now for everybody around the world to see. Yeah. Yeah. And on this, like, you know, this, this website that is, that is acclaimed and known for, it's not just like in the abyss and like the 17,000 blogs that students start for class. (laughs) Yeah. And we start blogs for my class too. I am guilty, but yeah, no, that's, it's got such a purpose. That's awesome. Have you had any response from genealogists or family members or community, like because of the find a grave stories? We have, we've had, um, negative and positive response. Most of the, most of it positive. Mm -hmm. Most of the response has been uh, from family members who say, oh, thank you very much. This Mm -hmm. clears up something. Mm -hmm. Um, Some family members just say thank you. And here's also what else we know. So it might spark them to put more up on Find a Grave, which is nice because uh, sometimes it will confirm or correct what we've done. Mm -hmm. And so that's nice. Or on... In the other direction, sometimes we're correcting what they have because we've had occasions where a um, family member says, no, that's not correct. And I've had students call the National Archives, and students can do this. Adults can't. Students can call archives. They can call historical societies that make you pay for digital copies. Mm -hmm. But if a student wants it, I don't know why. I think it's because they're kids. They They have more power. Um, <laughs> That's not hurt a lot. <laughs> yeah. But they can, and I always tell the kids, you know, you know, tear up a little bit. <laughs> but archivists will bend over backwards for kids. Yeah. And I had a student call the National Archives saying, hey, I need the enlistment records for so-and-so, and I need help. And, and they sent I can't remember, 10 pages worth of digital copies. That oh, would man. Usually I get a, 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 you know, dead signal. Yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> You're too old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, or they'll tell me if the research room is open, you know, in D.C. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, helpful. Yeah, and, but for a student, 
That's why I tell them you're going to have to make the call. Yeah. You've got to own this. And I wonder if they get, because I'm like i thinking of their perspective, and I bet they get excited. Like there's a kid calling me for a project. Like I just oh, bet I, that I think so. a lot. You, yeah. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, usually if it's some old stuffy professor or grad student, yeah. you know, they get that all the time. But a teenager who's actually inter- he, he was interested in history and wants yes. to get something done, yes. yeah, they're, they're terribly excited about that. So th- that helps. And... When we had those records from the National Archives, we could prove to the family, no, no, this is, these are the actual records. Yeah. Your uh, great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather or whatever it may be was not in that regiment. They were in this regiment. Yeah. And that was a typo or something. And Misremembered. Misremembered, yeah. yeah. Historical memory is, is very interesting. And, and this is the other problem. A lot of these guys would jump regiment to regiment. Mm-hmm. And they may have only told the stories of a particular regiment. Right. And that's not the only regiment they were in. And maybe they were demoted because they had done something kind of bad, maybe stolen something. And, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you don't want to say, hey, yeah, I was, <laughs> I, was I, I, I started out as a uh, major and now I'm a private. And, right. No, nobody needs to know that. Yeah, there that's right. There would be very few ways to follow up once you came home, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Like, who, who's going to know? Oh, man, that is so, so interesting. So we talked a little bit before the podcast also about, like, responses from, like, genealogists. Like, do, mm. so, like, and is this, are these just people with, like, personal interests who, like, look at Find a Grave and are trying to, like, chart kind of where their own personal family? Or is that, wow, this is a silly question. I'm so sorry that I didn't, like, know this coming in. I feel a little ignorant. Is that, like a job that somebody has to like search out family lineage or? Well, it's, yeah, you can have both. Mm -hmm. You can also just have somebody who likes um, cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Um, There are people on Find a Grave that all they do is go around and photograph headstones and put them on Find a Grave. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds kind of strange, but it's almost like a competition, like how many photographs of headstones can I get and oh, wow. they'll say you know I photograph 15,000 headstones in four different states and that's interesting but they have no information to go along with those it's just the photographs all they have is what's on the headstone right and those individuals are usually very um, welcoming of any information we have yeah others are a little more diligent mm-hmm. and that yeah, it, it's kind of their hobby, genealogy, and their job, and they want to mm-hmm. get as much as they can. They are a little more strict with what they're going to put up, mm-hmm. and those are the ones that we usually. That's always good for us to have our backup. Yeah, it's always good to have a citation because like, they're not just going to take us for at face value. Right, right. Um, the last category are the the family members mm-hmm. that are putting those up, and. You know, it's strange. Not a lot of family members own on Find a Grave those. I mean, it's usually somebody else saying, hey, that's my uncle or that's my aunt or whatever on Find a Grave, and somebody else owns that memorial. Um, and family members are, are are very happy to hear something about their family. And, and like I said earlier, they, those are the ones that will usually – It'll start something with them, and they'll yeah. it'll spark an interest, and then they'll put more up, and they'll put photographs, and then we'll find, oh, this is what this person looked like. Because a lot of times we don't have a yeah. photograph to go off of at all, which is which is a bonus for us. Yes. Um, and then there's the story. Sometimes we have to tell the family members that uh, the headstone is is incorrect, mm-hmm. and that's that can be a, a tough conversation. Right. Does it cost family members to like fix headstones? Or is that like a government sort of? The, uh, you know, the government-issued headstone, I believe, um, the first one is free, and I think a replacement is um, a cost, but it's I think it's fairly minimal. I don't really know. I just wondered, because I know that, like, it just, like, thinking from the family's perspective, like, if something was wrong and you wanted to have it fixed on the headstone, like... Now, that I would think that the government would right. reissue. Hopefully. Unless that's the way it was submitted. Yeah. Which... There again comes into those, you know, how research is done and mm-hmm. historical memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, if the story was that John was part of this regiment and he did this and that's mm-hmm. what's told and that's what they put on the headstone and that's what's reported in the obituary, mm-hmm. but maybe John 
wasn't part of that regiment Mm -hmm. or didn't even fight for that state, Mm -hmm. um, but told the story anyway. Yeah. Which that, you know, (laughs) that gets into a whole other realm. Now, that's a rarity. That is, is, we've only had one major issue with a headstone. Mm -hmm. Um, We've had minor issues, you know regiment number or something like that, Mm -hmm. but never where a complete regiment, state, everything was incorrect. Mm -hmm. Um, Even the name was wrong, the first name. Oh, no. Um, And what was sad about that one was that was the replacement headstone, um, which had just been put in, I think, a few months before we started our research. And so that headstone, I mean... That it would replace the, the, the already incorrect headstone was replaced by another incorrect headstone. Yes. So those are not fun conversations to have with family members. Yeah, but I'm sure in the long run, like, you, you're definitely accessing this idea of, like, we're creating a greater good through the work we're doing in the classroom. And that's always so neat to have because sometimes there's a lot of school that we do, and sometimes it's hard to figure our way out of it, but a lot of it, it's just very isolated and encapsulated, right? We're doing this because it teaches you a skill that you – we think we'll probably have to use later. But this is, you know, we're doing this because we're helping. We're helping a larger cause. And that's really, really exciting. Where did you get this idea to, you know, do all the, to, you know, to go around and take pictures of headstones and to, to you know, like to create this, this project out of it? Did you have other teachers that were already doing it? Like what inspired you to create this very, like, exciting storytelling process? Well, I'd heard of a group of students in a small town in Kansas doing this and the historical society that's when they started that database Mm -hmm. and I thought that was a great idea and so I took it to our our students at the time I was teaching in a middle school and I said well we need to do this and I thought well how many I mean surely there aren't going to be that many Mm -hmm. um, in Jackson County which is where I was at the time and it took us six years to do four cemeteries. Wow. How many cemeteries are there in Jackson County? Oh, there's tons. Yeah. There's tons. Once you get beyond the major Holton, Hoyt, Mayetta, mm-hmm. then you go out into the country, yeah. and you've got little family plots here and there, little townships that don't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, and so there's cemeteries, tons of little cemeteries. More than four. Oh, <laughs> yeah, way more. <laughs> yeah, maybe close to... 40. Yeah. So you had like a lot of material. Right. And uh, we started with Hoyt and Mayetta because mm-hmm. that was the school district and took two and a half, two years to do that. We stopped for one year and came down to Topeka Cemetery as a service project. Mm-hmm. And Topeka Cemetery is going to take longer than uh, probably one, two, three, maybe five years. It's, it's, there's a massive amount of Civil yeah. War veterans buried there. That was one of my upcoming questions was, like, do we, do, do we in Topeka, Kansas, have enough, like, you know, Civil War veterans buried here to make this a long-lasting project? It, that really surprises me that we do. Is that, I don't know. I have always known that the Civil War had, like, an extreme, like, a lot of people were involved, but that's still quite a, that's still a lot. It's, it's an amazing amount. And then Holton Cemetery, and that was our, we did, there are two cemeteries in Hoyt. Mm-hmm. Um, but only one of those cemeteries only has like two, mm-hmm. and then the rest are in the in the major city cemetery. And then Mayetta, that was uh, year two, one and two. Mm-hmm. Year off for Topeka Cemetery, and then back to Holton. Holton took three years. There are so many buried in Holton. Wow. Um, and it was a it it took forever. We just. There were more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And, and the other problem is you have um, civilian headstones versus governmental headstones, so they don't even – you wouldn't even recognize this person's name as a Civil War veteran. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't get a government-issued headstone. They just have their civilian headstone. And so you may be walking right by several Civil War veterans and not even know it. Yeah. So do government-issued headphones and civilian headphones, they, they, they look distinctly different. Like you would be able to identify a government-issued headstone? Government-issued headstone, that's usually what we start with. Um, small, like what you'd see at Arlington National right, Cemetery. Right, right, okay. And then the civilian can be whatever the mm-hmm. family wants. Sometimes they'll have both. Yeah. Um, sometimes you'll have the little bronze star mm-hmm. from the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, 
And sometimes that's the only thing you have to go off of. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they never get a headstone. They just get a little, you know, a little star or whatever. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's why it took, take so long because you have so many that are buried here. Yeah. You ask, asked about the longevity of this project. I, I would imagine Shawnee County alone, we probably have enough to keep students busy for the next 10 years. Well, that's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. I don't know. I think Topeka Cemetery might take a long time. Yeah. Um, Lawrence would be another one. Oak Hill Cemetery is a massive amount mm-hmm. of Civil War veterans. So I think Topeka Cemetery and some of the older cemeteries in, in Topeka, Rochester being one of them. Yeah. Um, I think will take us quite a while. I think Rochester, we're already on year two, yeah. or second semester, I should say, and we still have a ways to go. I found 68 without doing too much work mm-hmm. in Rochester Cemetery, and that doesn't include all the gentlemen who don't have a government-issued headstone. Right, right. That's so That's so interesting. I feel like I'm learning so much about this city that I've lived in for literally my entire life. Um, cool. And what, the picture that, like, brought this whole conversation to fruition that, like, brought me to, like, send you an email to ask you to be here today was that, like, because you, you took your students to the Rochester Cemetery, right? Mm-hmm. How did, like, was, what was that like? Well, it's it's always interesting because um, we spend a day, because they're high school students, because it's it's small class. Mm-hmm. When I was doing this with middle school students, we had... 70, 80 students, and that's that's a chore to take to the archives. Yeah. But with a class of 25 to 30, mm-hmm. going to the archives is not a big deal. So we can go to the archives, spend a day there, finding even more information, and, you know, helping with those uh, roadblocks because the archivists down there are exceedingly helpful. Yeah. And then we come back, and as we're coming back to school, we'll stop at the cemetery, find out where they're guy is buried Mm -hmm. and uh, maybe find out some more information, look at the headstone, take a picture, and maybe clean up around the headstone if we need to. But usually we don't have to do any cleaning because the the gentleman that runs Rochester Cemetery is is always on top of everything and we never have to help out. (laughs) I'm always hoping we get a service project out of this as well, but... uh, He's, he's he's too good. Yeah, he's too good. <laughs> you don't need any volunteer hours <laughs> from our kids. You're too good. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. This whole project is just something that that's that screams like something you'd never forget as a high school student. Like you, you'd always be able to be like this one time. And I bet you'd never forget their name too, right? Like you would just have such a unique bonding experience with this Civil War veteran. So as you're going through this whole process and learning all about their ins and outs of these soldiers' lives, is there ever any like discrepancy over how much they fought or where they fought or even if they fought at all? And how, how do you how do you deal with that? Oh yeah, and that is that is a great question because sometimes these these gentlemen are in a unit and they never see battle at all Mm -hmm. they're stationed you know as a a watch or guarding some hill somewhere um but we've had we've had a few gentlemen that we know exactly where they were Mm -hmm. uh in the civil war um one this year this second semester was very interesting this gentleman was fighting i know it sounds strange he was in north dakota (laughs) fighting in the civil war and you would ask who in the world fighting in North Dakota? <laughs> but he's he's not fighting this Confederates. Uh-huh. He's fighting Native Americans, yeah. and the only reason we know that he is there is any kind of um, battle that he's in at all is because in 1889, Kansas did a, a whole book called this uh, Civil War Veterans Enrollment Records. Mm-hmm. And in that record book, if your guy is in there, it's usually fairly detailed. Well, this guy, it says in his record, shot, wounded with an arrow in the leg at such and such battle. Hmm. So we know right there. Yeah. He was at that battle. Right. And then at that point, the student can go through and say, okay, what was going on at this battle? How did they get there? Yeah. You know, what's going on? Right. Another one was a... a a guy who it says wounded in the arm at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Right. 
and holy cow, Battle of Fredericksburg, not a minor little battle. This is big. So we ended up calling the National Park Service Mm -hmm. because they run Fredericksburg Battle Site. And they not only found this where he was, but Mm -hmm. which unit he was with, who was his commanding officer, who was the overall commanding officer, which happened to be General Meade, who at that time was not overall command of the Union forces, but was um, one of the sub-commanders, so to speak, right. at Fredericksburg. Yeah. And they have actually have a breakout. They, they almost beat, you know, they're starting to roll up the Confederates, and then comes in Stonewall Jackson, who takes them prisoner. Mm-hmm. He ends up in Andersonville. The, the horrible, nasty prison of the Confederacy. Oh, my goodness. What a story. <laughs> um, and probably the best one is Orlando Dribblebiss. Oh, what a name. Spelled 900 million different ways. <laughs> Who is from Berks County, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And is enlisted for three months. Now, you would think, why were an enlistment's uniform? Well, states ran those. Mm-hmm. And sometimes governors of states or representatives would say, hey, I just want to do this, trying to boost their enrollment, Mm -hmm. and would just do a three-month, what, 90-day enlistment. Yeah. Well, three boys from the Dribblebus family enlist. And these three brothers, three months, they figure, hey, you know, no big deal. Three months, we'll be in and out. Those three months happen to fall right at the Battle of Gettysburg. Oh, they all three fight at the battle. Yeah. One is wounded, and he is on the uh, Pennsylvania Memorial mm-hmm. at Gettysburg. And Orlando, well, the other one of the three brothers, isn't wounded, fights in the battle all three days, um, and then comes out to Kansas and lives the rest of his life out here. Those are rarities. Most of the time we have no idea yeah. if they actually fought in a battle. Right. And so what I have to tell the students is you can't say they were at that battle. Mm-hmm. You can say their regiment was at that battle. Yeah. But we have, unless we have definitive proof, all we can say is the regiment was there. They were part of the regiment at that time. They may have been sick. They may have been yeah. doing some other duty. We don't know. Yeah. And so that becomes uh, part of the process. And that becomes part of the, the major issue. We have to have definitive proof. We have to have that information. If we don't have it, we can't report it. Right. Your language has to be really specific in yes. regards to what goes in yeah. the findagrave.com. Yeah. So when it comes to our sources, Kansas Census from this year, right. um, the Kansas Enrollment of Civil War Veterans, the GAR Post Reports, mm-hmm. whatever that may be, and and then confirm that with other things. And when you get enough of that, you have a pretty good picture of who this, who this guy was, or at least a little snippet of their life. Yeah, that's really interesting. What advice would you give to anybody listening? Like ways, you know, problems that they could overcome really quickly or just things to be aware of before they get started on a project like this? Well, I think one of the the biggest things to be aware of is the time you think you're going to spend, it's going to be more. And so always keep that in mind. If you think you're going to get this done in two weeks, it may be three. Yeah. If you say it's going to be a week, it might be a month. I mean, you just never know. Uh, so you're going to have to pare it down. Don't try to do too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember the first year I said, we're going to do, you know, a full page. And, oh, my goodness, I was – that's all I was doing, and it took forever. Yeah. It, it's got to be short. Mm-hmm. Keep it simple. Let the kids have fun doing the research. And let them go down the rabbit holes every once in a while because that's part of what research is. And maybe they'll find something, you know, some tasty little tidbit somewhere. Thank you so much for being here today. I feel like I've learned a lot just about like Topeka, Kansas, but also about like there are so many ideas to be thrown out in here and you know like the the access that you show your kids to research into various things and you know talking about how much uh, like the language choices that you make in the findagrave.com and really accessing that authentic audience. This is this is awesome. I really I appreciate this and it makes me want to I don't know. I'm trying to think. Like as we go through these interviews, I always like, how could I do this in my own classroom? I don't know how I can do this, but we'll. I'll come back to you. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me, Andrea. Yeah, it's been great. Of course. Thank you so much for listening. As always, we really appreciate you being here. It's crazy 
crazy exciting that somebody besides me is listening to this podcast. So thank you so much. Um, make sure that you follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you just search the suggestion box podcast, we will pop right up. We really appreciate any interaction on there. If you ever have any questions or you want to reach out and let us know your idea that you'd like to share on the podcast or nominate somebody you want us to contact, please email us at the suggestion box podcast at gmail.com. Also consider going to our website, the suggestion box podcast.com. And we're on, uh, we are on, sorry, I almost went over that whole thing again. Uh, the, sometimes the tape gets going, you know, we are, we're in iTunes, Apple podcasts, SoundCloud, Google play, uh, a lot of those major places where you can get your podcasts from. So make sure you're listening. We really appreciate it. We are here every other week and yeah. Special thank you as always to Dr. Heather and Roger Caswell. They are glorious like so glorious i can't even describe from the flint hills writing project they are the directors and they make every one of our dreams a little bit closer <laughs> um, and then also big big shout out to krista mcgriff our graphic designer she is the bomb.com and i'm not ashamed to say that nope Mm -mm. not aging myself at all and then thank you to sonic tonic audio who does the intro and outro music for this podcast we really appreciate every person who has contributed to this and yeah we're so happy to have you here see you next time teachers teachers